Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us again for yet another panel. For those of you who I didn't meet this morning, I am Holly Hansen. I'm a regional reporter for the Texan News, reporting primarily from Houston and Harris County, but I do cover a wide variety of issues. This afternoon, we're going to talk about abortion and vaccines. And I would like to remind the audience that this is a very sensitive topic for many people. And uh, just have respect and courtesy for differences of opinion on this issue. And uh, I'll introduce our distinguished panel now. We have a fine group of ladies here. We have Representative Donna Howard from Austin. Uh, Donna Howard has been a critical care nurse and president of the Texas Nurses Association and brings a great deal of medical knowledge to these issues. Then, of course, we have Senator Colcourst of Bredham, uh, Senate District 18, a Republican. And uh, Senator Colcourst is the chair of the Senate Committee on Health and Human Services. And then we have a freshman legislator from Round Rock, where I used to live also. Uh, this is... <laughs> Carolyn Harris may be a freshman, but she's no stranger to the legislative process. I think has been involved in seven previous sessions. Is that correct? Seven years. Seven. Uh, oh, seven years. Okay. Yeah, I, I was going to say you're a little young she's for not that. Old enough, she would be, yeah. you know, crawling yeah. in diapers or something. But uh, thank you so much for joining us, and thank all of you for being here today for this this topic, which is a little more challenging, I would say, a little more sensitive than some of the things we've talked about today in some ways, um, especially for those of us who are women, and, and they affect us directly. Um, the big news in 2022, in many minds, was the Supreme Court decision over overturning Roe versus Wade, and that returned the abortion issue to the states, and the state laws here in the state of Texas uh, triggered immediately, and as my understanding goes, there are three laws that are on the books regarding abortion, but one of the biggest criticisms that we've heard about Texas law is that there's no exception for rape and incest. We have heard difficult stories about very young girls. It is plausible that a 10-year-old girl could conceive and become pregnant and may be the victim of incest or rape. And so those are some of the difficult deal uh, issues that we are dealing with or situations. And so what I'd like to hear from each of you is what you think about the problem here and what you think the state legislature ought to do. Should they re-examine this law and see if there is a um, plausibility to have an exception for rape or incest. And we'll start with you, Representative Howard. Thank you, um, and thanks for inviting me to be here. I appreciate it. I did look before coming here at the ITOP report that the health department keeps uh, that looks at abortion statistics. Uh, we've done this for several years now. I can't remember exactly when it started, Lois, but it's been for a while now. Uh, she has her notes. <laughs> but... Um, it, I believe it was 2020 that I was looking at, <clears throat> which was before this happened and uh, before the change in laws happened, and uh, looking at those reported abortions for those eight, younger than 18, which by statute would be an assault. And there were a couple of abortions reported on uh, girls 11 years and younger, and then there were 20 some odd on girls 13, 14, and then it went up from there. My point being that yes, indeed, we have young girls who are getting pregnant. And the only way that a young girl like that could get pregnant is by being assaulted. Even if it's by a family member or someone she knows, that's an assault. So I believe that from everything I see and from what I hear that the, the majority of Texans indicate that they would like some kind of exception. And I do know that there's an argument for having no exceptions, but I'm coming from the perspective of, yes, let's look at what kind of reasonable exceptions we could have here. And so I have drafted some legislation, and I've been working with the, uh, the groups that uh, work with those who are survivors of sexual assault, both adults and children. 
and trying to come up with something that also honors the work of the Sexual Assault Survivors Task Force, which we got in place, a uh, bipartisan basis across the Senate and the House a couple of sessions back in the governor's office to look at our sexual assault system, the medical, the forensic, the legal, the prosecutorial, the whole thing, and try to look at how can we be better about being survivor-centered and trauma-informed because very few people report their assaults for a wide variety of reasons, but one of the main reasons is because the assaults are oftentimes by a family member or somebody they know, and they do not want to get into this legal system. So in working with them, and I'll try to wrap this up real quickly here so you can get to other questions, but in looking at what they had to say about how we should be addressing this and knowing that the majority do not want to report through the legal system, we wanted to create an exception that honored that and left the decision between the physician and the patient to identify that this assault had occurred rather than having a forced reporting because that would be re-traumatizing for many of these survivors who have been through horrific experiences. So indeed, yes, I do have that legislation and that is something that I'm gonna be pushing for. Senator Colcourse. You know, Holly, you, you started your remarks by saying this is a very sensitive and, and, and tough issue, and it certainly is. Um, you know, Representative Howard certainly makes good points about those under the age of 18 and that it is sexual assault. Um, if you look at our trigger law, it does not make those exceptions except for the endangerment of, of a mother's life. Um, you know, I've, I've really thought about this for a long time. There's going to be a lot of legislation that's introduced, and I think that um, anyone who is duly elected to the Texas legislature and introduces legislation, all of that should be, you know, looked at and considered and debated uh, at different times. I do fear when you start making the exceptions that it's a slippery slope, and it, 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 it does put... Um, the legislature in, in a position uh, at times to to uh, play God in ways. And this is something that I've, I've thought about a lot. And so, you know, when, when we talk about someone that's uh, sexually assaulted uh, and that they don't want to re report um, who has uh, sexually assaulted them, you know, if, if this were to ever be considered, I, I, I would not vote for anything that wouldn't absolutely mandate that whoever sexually assaulted this person would also be duly prosecuted uh, and go through the court system. Um, because again, um, it creates that, sec that, that slippery slope. And so at this point, I am comfortable with, with where Texas is, um, is in, 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 in our position. Again, we come together every 140 days to debate these tough issues. And I do believe that every voice should be listened to. And so I, I know that we will hear from a lot. I, I will just say, when we celebrate life, um, you look at the same report that um, Representative Howard looked at. In August of 2022, uh, there were three abortions, and uh, those, all three, were done and reported as health and life of the mother issues as required by our law. But in August of 2021, there were 5,706 abortions. So if you look at the laws that we've passed, it's saved 5,703 lives just in that particular month that we pulled from the data. That's really amazing. And who knows who they go on to become. Um, but, you know, I, I believe that life starts at inception. And I, I want to, again, be respectful um, because there, there, there is, when I'm asked this question, uh, and again, I go back and review uh, where we are in stat statute and do a lot of praying about it. Um, but um, at this point, you know, uh, I have voted for the laws. I am profoundly pro-life and unapologetic about that. Uh, but with due respect to uh, my colleague, uh, you and I carry a lot of nursing bills together. We've done some fabulous work together. And, you know, but we differ on some issues and some of our views uh, moving forward. So sensitive issue, um, and I, I don't want to make light of uh, any uh, person that's ever been sexually assaulted and what they have been through. 
uh, and if it, ha it leads to uh, the conception of a child, uh, their decision uh, to, to uh, you know, we need to have a support system around them as they move through and carry that child to birth. Representative Harris. Thank you. I would echo what Senator Colcourse uh, said. I am also very profoundly pro-life, and uh, that stems from my mother. Uh, my mother had an abortion when she was 19 years old, right after Roe v. Wade was put in place, and it was very traumatic for her. She didn't know what her options were. You know, that was there weren't many options back then that they told you about, and um, it was something that she was kind of force into, and so she is very passionately pro-life. She uh, volunteers at Agape Pregnancy Resource Center in Round Rock, and through her, um, her passion for being pro-life, I'm actually one of 11 children. Uh, so she, <laughs> yeah, so uh, she definitely put it into practice. Um, but I do wanna reiterate, uh, these are such traumatic and horrific situations. One of the benefits of being a freshman and just having been elected is, uh, you know, I knocked on more than 8,000 doors in my campaign. And this came up a lot because I worked with uh, my former boss, Senator Brian Hughes, on the heartbeat bill. And people knew that, and so they would ask me. And I heard a lot of stories from people that explained their situation to me. Many cases like this, there's, again, heartbreaking situations. And the one thing I would say about um, the laws that we have on the books now, these are not new. Uh, the Democrats put these in place um, in the past, and so uh, we've had these laws on the books before. You know, no abortions allowed unless in the case of saving the life of the mother. What I will add, though, is what is not what is new now is that we have the alternatives to abortion program that comes alongside a lot of these mothers. We just uh, the legislature funded it at $100 million this past session. And I've toured a lot of these clinics. And some of the things that strike me the most is they just take this mother and the situation she's in so seriously. They make sure that even the waiting room is tailored in a way that's a calming presence that makes the mom feel safe, protected, you know, they go through all of the options. They make sure that she's got someone to talk with her about the trauma, about what happened to her. They provide job training. Some of these clinics uh, partner with homes where these moms can stay and get away from that terrible abusive situation they might be in, and they help them find jobs. Uh, one of the clinics pairs you, uh, the mom with a caretaker until the child is three years old. Uh, helps them find a good school, make sure that they've got food, clothing, diapers, whatever it may be. And so, you know, I always say in Texas, we are pro-life, um, but we are also pro-woman, pro-mom, and pro-family. And so when we pass laws, we pass them to make sure that we have healthy moms, healthy families, that we're pro-life from the moment of conception all the way to the end of life. And so that's one of the things that I'm excited to work on you know, as a new member and um, in this session is how do we help those moms, first of all, in those traumatic situations? You know, how do we make it easier for them to report? You know, how do we make it easier for, to remove them from those situations? Love them, help them find healing, and do it in a tangible way as well. Again, with this job training, food, clothing, diapers. And so I, I'm hopeful that we can add more funding to that program and increase uh, other programs, maybe reform our adoption system, our foster care system. And so I'm really looking forward to the work that we can do you know, all across the board in the pro-life movement, whether it's you know, the mom and the kiddo uh, throughout. So. Is it okay if I say something more? Or do you want to say sure, something else? And, yeah. uh, just want to clarify that uh, from my standpoint, from people who, who believe some of the ways that I look at this, would also consider ourselves to be very much pro-life in terms of supporting yes. lives, supporting the mom's lives, supporting the lives of our Texas families. Um, and I realize that that has a connotation, but, but I, I, I bristle a little bit because I want to make sure that, that, that we are all talking about supporting these moms and babies. And I very much appreciate Absolutely. your comments about looking at how we can do that. 
Um, you know, we have more than half the births in this state are Medicaid births, and that that we are not currently providing sufficient funding to cover the health care of those moms and their babies. And so I'm hopeful, too, that we're going to be putting more money into the budget to look at how do we increase the funding to not only serve those that are currently having babies in our state, but what we anticipate is going to be an increased number of moms and babies in our state so that they can be the healthiest they can be in a state where we have one of the highest rates of maternal morbidity and mortality. So we do have some areas we're going to, think, I think, have to find some common ground on here to, to figure out how we're going to help our Texas moms. And that's, uh, thank you for providing this kind of a segue, because one of my questions for you, Representative Howard, is your, your party is in the minority in the, in the state legislature. And so what is your strategy going forward? And, uh, you know, as you, you have deeply held beliefs on this issue. And so how do you, how does your party propose to work with the Republican majority to, uh, you know, implement some of the things you're looking for? Sure. Um, First off, I guess I'll clarify, too, that I'm the chair of the Women's Health Caucus, which is a bipartisan caucus. We have had a couple of Republicans over the years that have been a part of it. Right now, I believe we have, we had two, Jim Murphy was one, and he left, so, but we have one more. <laughs> that being said, uh, the approach that we're taking to this is clearly understanding, as the minority party, that there's not going to be any repeal of this. I'm not going in there in a combative way. I'm going to approach this, and I'm encouraging my colleagues to approach this in what do we do to mitigate some of the damage that we see here in terms of exceptions that we think need to be in place and protecting the, the lives of those moms who want their babies and have complications, but because of ambiguities in the law, ha have, ha have prevented doctors from feeling like they could intervene medically. We need to clarify what the language is so that we don't have that happening anymore. Um, oh, I've already mentioned the, the, the rape and incest, but also the other big, the hub of everything I'm going to be looking at is access. How do we increase access to health care? And, you know, the House, in a bipartisan fashion, last session passed the 12 months postpartum uh, extension of Medicaid coverage. Uh, working with the Senate, we went back down to six months. Uh, that never got approved, so uh, we're still at two months, although we've been having the public health emergency. I don't want to get complicated, but the fact is we're still only a two-month postpartum state. So I'm hoping that we're going to rally around finding things like that that we can do, extending postpartum coverage to 12 months, which is when we have the vast majority of the maternal deaths and also the, uh, the morbidity issues that can, can be near deaths and can cause lifelong complications. So... I think we could find some commonality there. And so my approach is let's clarify language to make sure that we put things in place that don't have unintended consequences, from my vantage point anyway, and then also do everything we can to increase access so we have healthy moms, healthy babies, healthy families. Senator, can I add to that? Because that is true that, that our... Um, our bill was rejected by CMS, and and Representative Howard, I know you know this. The the bill that has came out in in the um, House had a language that prohibited someone that had had abortion to be able to get twelve months, and that's why they rejected it. And it, it's it's really interesting to me because. Of course, you know, Tony Rose, a uh, Democrat uh, from Dallas, and I picked up the bill and, you know, our compromise, and again, going back to the data and different things, we're in the public health emergency. Uh, we have Healthy Texas Women that does all this wraparound. Uh, yeah, you know, I felt like it was a great victory for all of us, and to have it rejected uh, by the current CMS was, was disappointing. I think it was disappointing for everyone here in Texas um, because the language is, that's how it was originally drafted. So there's, you know, it, it, we, we could be a lot further down the road. The public health emergency should end and it will end soon. Um, and so we have to take some actions. Could you could you just explain a little bit for the audience that doesn't know what what that what happened there and what is CMS and and yeah. how did that um, transpire? Centers for Medicare and Medicaid and CMS. You know, anytime you have any exception of Medicaid rules, you have to 
ask uh, basically permission. It's through waivers. Uh, it's because you're waiving a part of the law. Um, every state is required to postpartum carry uh, two months. Um, states can extend up to 12 months. And so that's when you ask for that permission, basically, in, in different, and we call them, you know, section, blah, 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 and it gets very technical, but you're asking permission uh, because Medicaid is a federal program that is a partner with the states. You know, it's about a 60-40 program, give or take. Now, FMAP, which I won't go into, but the long and short. And the public health emergency, the PHE, is what um, occurred when uh, COVID began. And so at that point, when the public health emergency was declared by the federal government, uh, everyone that was on the Medicaid rolls is frozen, even though maybe you um, are past the time or you've made more money, whatever, you cannot be um, taken off the Medicaid rolls, whether it's a child. Uh, you know, our Medicaid program basically covers uh, pregnant women, um, and children, and then uh, people on temporary assistance for needy families. Um, so it's a fairly narrow program. But those uh, Medicaid rolls, have, they're very large right now. And uh, so eventually there is going to be, you know, this moment where the public health emergency ends, uh, and we should celebrate that as a nation uh, and move on beyond uh, the COVID years, which I know we're going to talk about in a yes. few minutes. Okay, thank you. And Representative Harris, not to put you on the spot, uh, as a freshman, just so you know, I mean, she did work on the heartbeat bill uh, when you were helping out with the legislature. And um, can you explain to the audience how that law works? Because there's a lot of confusion about, you know, how, what, what are the enforcement mechanisms that are tied to that law? Absolutely. So that was actually what made our heartbeat law in Texas very unique was the enforcement mechanism because, you know, Roe v. Wade uh, says a state cannot put a burden, undue burden uh, on women uh, to keep them from having an abortion. And so in the heartbeat bill, the defense mechanism is actually any citizen. And so you can bring a suit against a doctor for, for um, doing an abortion on a child that uh, has a heartbeat. And so we have similar laws like this. We have similar functions like this where a citizen can bring a suit against someone in Medicaid, actually. Um, and so it wasn't, it's not something new, but it was a creative way of looking at um, this uh, situation. And so that's actually why it was upheld at the Supreme Court. And we, I mean, that law saved thousands of lives before Roe v. Wade was overturned. And there's a lot of consensus on, you know, the heartbeat is a sign of life. We should protect it. And so that bill actually, you know, I don't know if um, y'all had a chance to see any of Senator Hughes' debate on that or anything like that. But one thing I loved is he said, okay, I want everybody in the audience to, you know, put their hand up here and, and just sense your heartbeat. And... He gave everyone a second and he said, you know, we protect those with heartbeats in every other realm of our laws. Why not the most vulnerable among us? And so that was the goal of the heartbeat bill. And again, it did. It saved thousands of lives. And we're so grateful that we had that in Texas, even before Roe v. Wade was overturned. And the Supreme Court reviewed that law before the overturning of Roe v. Wade, upheld it. And we really celebrated that in Texas. And I'm very grateful I got to work with Senator Hughes on that. He has been a champion for the pro-life movement for quite a long time. And so I'm very blessed to have worked with him. Senator Colcourst, a question for you. Representative Howard brought up an issue that we've heard in the media that uh, there is maybe some confusion in Texas abortion laws that uh, they suggest uh, some doctors are refusing to provide treatment for things like ectopic pregnancy uh, under the guise that they may be prosecuted under these laws. Do you think there is a need to go back and revisit the language and perhaps clarify that, or do you think it's, it's clear enough yeah, as I, written? I, I was a little surprised uh, about the confusion. I mean, I... I, I I think that the trigger law um, is pretty specific. If I could just read, uh, 
from that that um, it clearly stated that if a medical professional in the exercise of reasonable medical judgment provides the best opportunity for the unborn born child to, to survive, unless the reasonable medical judgment that matter would create a greater risk of pregnant females' death or a serious risk of substantial impairment of a major bodily function of the pregnant female. I don't know, that's pretty clear to me. So um, I, I do think between the heartbeat bill and then uh, Dobbs, and there, there was a moment for pause. Now, let's keep in mind that we you know, are at a moment um, in COVID where I think that we saw medicine change greatly. Uh, I, I, I just do. Uh, I'm somewhat saddened by it. Um, and so I'm hoping that we can kind of get through this fog and get back uh, to medical practice where we used to. And judge uh, the the um, doctors are trained at a very high level. We hope a great, greatly high level to make these decisions. Ectopic is you know it presents itself. Um, there are other situations, and I'm not sure. You know, Representative Howard, you being a nurse, could we list every situation? I trust the judgment of a doctor. And, you know, I know we're going to get to COVID here in a moment, but, you know, during COVID, we all of a sudden didn't trust the judgment of a doctor. It had to be cookbook medicine uh, that you can only do these certain procedures. And so that that's something, again, I hope we get through this fog. So in looking at um, these different bills, I think it's clear um, but certainly, again, that's what we come together for 140 days every other year to look at these issues. And I, I certainly will listen to medical professionals to see where it's unclear and see if we've missed something. Yeah, uh, I'm also drafting legislation about trying to do the clarification. And, you know, none of us up here are doctors. And I've been working with the doctors with the uh, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, as well as the Texas Medical Association, to look at what language would make them feel like they can use their medical judgment in intervening. And, you know, it may, it may make sense to us, it may make sense to people that read that, that that should cover it, but that's not what the physicians are saying. And I'm listening to the physicians because they're the ones that are actually being put in this position, and they are the ones that are saying, this is not clear enough for me to know at what point I can intervene. The woman is not yet dying. She has complications. You know, am I going to have to send her home until she starts to get worse and is actually exhibiting what the language says in terms of without doing this, she would die? because she's not at that point yet. And that's, that's kind of the gray area that they have been talking about that has made them pause because it's their livelihood, their license, and potential jail time that's on the line. It's not something they're taking cavalierly. This is an extremely serious thing for them to have to consider in their medical practice. And the thing about listing potential complications that is, again, somewhat difficult is, medicine is, of course, a science, but it also has judgment attached to it. That's why you can't just, all of us, you know, lear, lear, this is the one, two, three, this is what you do in every situation. No, that's not the case. That's why we have doctors and medical providers who interact with their patients and determine what's uniquely the best medical interve intervention for their patient at the time. They need to have the ability to use their medical judgment that they've been trained to use, that we count on them to use, to provide us the best possible care. So we're trying to figure out how to word it that gives them that space in which to use their medical judgment with each individual patient without being too prescriptive about, it can only be X, Y, and Z. And let me give you one other example. You know, we changed, Lois, I don't know if you remember this or not, we changed a, a few sessions back um, ectopic pregnancies uh, when, when Byron Cook was the head of state affairs um, he, had a, he had legislation that changed the definition of abortion in state statute to say that ectopic pregnancies were not abortions because in the medical sense of the word it's a termination that you use which is an abortion and in insurance language 
it's abortion. So he didn't want those two things associated. And, and so in state statute here in Texas, ectopic pregnancies are not considered abortions. Unfortunately, it was written in a way that was prescriptive, though, and there are ectopic pregnancies that do not occur the way it's written in the language. So once again, his intentions were good, but it had unintended consequences. So when we're trying to write legislation that is dictating what doctors can do, we have to be very careful about it because there, it is not... It is not something that can be that prescriptive. So we have, we're going back and looking at all of this with the doctors to see what kind of language we can put in place that will allow them to feel that they can comfortably use their medical judgment and take the best care of their patients. Well, that's a, this is a good time to segue into talking about vaccines and COVID treatment. Um, we may, if we have time, circle back to the uh, abortion issue, but let's move on at this point. Um, Senator Colcourse, you introduced legislation, I believe, in 2021 that essentially banned a vaccine passport. Uh, there is also confusion about that, about whether or not that applies to employers and whether or not they can mandate uh, vaccines, COVID vaccines, as a condition of employment. Can you talk a little bit about what your, what your legislation did and what it accomplished and what more may or may not need to be done now? Well, thank you for the question. And actually, Senate Bill 968 did not start with vaccine, prohibition of vaccine passports in it. It was added uh, during the committee process. Uh, you know, again, a lot of things were evolving. You know, we were still kind of in that pandemic. Uh, gosh, you know, the Senate, we tested every day. Listen... I have calluses in my <laughs> nasal passages. Um, I can do that swab just quick. I don't even, my eyes don't even water anymore. Um, but um, having said that, you know, as the process developed, you could kind of see where this was going. And we saw that in New York. Um, and, and, you know, the, 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 they kind of called, called it, there was segregation of people. So I decided to introduce this, and the committee agreed with me and uh, got it off the Senate floor in a very bipartisan manner and also out of the House in a very bipartisan manner that prohibits uh, a vaccine passport. So you cannot make someone, if they're going to a restaurant or to the movie theaters or entering uh, a place of business, show that they have vaccine status. Um, and we did that in a way that if you did that, um, you are going to lose your license. You're going to lose your liquor license. You're going to lose if you do that. We also gave uh, public uh, restaurants, you know, you can do temp checks and things like that, but uh, you cannot uh, demand a vaccine passport. So um, it did not prohibit employers from doing vaccine mandates. So we saw that in hospitals. It was debated in the Senate. It was added to one of the uh, I think it was a third call session by Governor Abbott. Uh, a bill did not pass either either chamber. So, uh, you know, we have seen now the military starting to peel back their vaccine mandate. Uh, I don't know how many hospitals have or have not yet. Um, there, there will be a robust debate whether or not that added to their workforce sh shortage. I know my daughter graduated with... Um, Several TCU has a very good nursing school, and there were just a lot of young ladies that said, I'm not getting the vaccine, so therefore, I mean, they would not go to work for certain hospitals. It was very interesting. I kind of lived it real time with these young women that did not want to be vaccinated. So I do believe this session, it is, it is time to begin to look at, um, you know, where we are in this process. And maybe in 2021, it was too early to do lessons learned. I thought it wasn't, but now I really think that it's lessons learned. And one of the things that I'll be working on is a VAERS system, a vac vaccine reaction system. I think, you know, Representative Howard brought up great points about what we expect from the medical profession and from the medical world and is to let them practice at um, their, their highest standard 
And I just don't believe that we allowed that. I mean, like we saw on social media, if you might offer an alternative or an off-label uh, solution to maybe um, early intervention in COVID, if you had COVID, you literally were censored. You're banned from Twitter. Uh, Texas Medical Board decides that they're going to pursue you and take your license away. And I, I, I just, I'm, I was really shocked that it, I, it was happening, and you're almost like, is this really happening? And then it was. And, you know, Jimmy got COVID, thank goodness. You know, we had uh, our primary care physician, he and I had this great, you know, discussion. I mean, Jimmy's uh, uh, oxygen uh, saturation was plummeting, and this was early on in the summer of 2020. And I said, listen, I want him on X, Y, and Z. Well, I don't I, I know. You either prescribe it or I'll find somebody. And, you know, Jimmy pulled out of the ditch and I didn't have to take him to the hospital and he didn't end up on a ventilator and he didn't end up dead. Um, and so I, I'm very, um, I am looking at all the facts. And, and it, it is time for us to have a very good discussion. Uh, all of you know uh, we're, we're seeing myocarditis in so many young people, uh, athletes, and so forth. And so this is what I want from science again. We used to say, this is a hypothesis, and you either prove it right or wrong. I mean, we either prove it right or wrong, but it's time that we start to investigate. Is mRNA good? Um, were, there other, uh, were there other options that actually help some people? Everyone's a little bit different. Tamiflu for influenza works on some people. It doesn't work on other people. It's, one, it's wonderful for me. Uh, I'm very susceptible to the influenza for some reason. And so I want to get us back to, you know, uh, I think Representative Howard very clearly stated that we have trained doctors and we need to let them practice that. So that's kind of my rant to give you um, a look at. I'm really willing to rip the Band-Aid off and look, and I think the American people need to do that. The CDC is backing up a little bit. Um, you have other doctors that were one way during COVID, and now they're starting to say, hey, something's going on and we really need to look at this. And to just you know, be honest. Go go back to sci science and 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 look at what is causing um, these deaths in younger people with these heart attacks. And is the vaccine the right way? And should these mandates, you know, should there really be mandates, or should you just make your own decision? We did have warp speed that came from Trump. Uh, we've never done this before, so I I, I believe that we should not have mandates for the COVID vaccines. I just, I'm, I'm not there. But it, it is the choice of, 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 you know, the person. If you want to do that, I, I fully support you, that you and your doctor need to converse about this and make the right decision. I have a follow-up question, but uh, Representative Harris, you were, you were nodding. Were you hearing a lot of this on the campaign trail? Just Yes, and I just wanted to add that uh, when we're talking about this discussion, we just need to keep in mind that, you know, those of us that are talking about it may not be 100% anti-vax. You know, we may just be careful and cautious and want to see more data. And um, going back to what you were saying about the medical field, one of my friend's daughters was in the same position. She is working on becoming a nurse, and it was right after the vaccine had been introduced, and she was told she had to get it in order to uh, complete her degree and her training, and she, she just wasn't comfortable. It was just you know, right after she just wanted to see more research, more data, especially studying medicine, you know, she just had a lot of questions. And it was so difficult for her to find a hospital that would allow her to continue her training that she almost left the field of nursing, you know. And these days, we can't afford that, you know. We, we need all we can get. And so, but I'm just going back to, you know, some of us just wanted to see more data. You know, this is one of the fastest processes I think we've ever seen a vaccine go through, right? And so we just want to make sure that it is safe, it is effective. And going to the doors, I talked to a family where the mother, son, and daughter went to get the vaccine, very pro-vaccine, you know, all on board. Son went into cardiac arrest, almost died. And the mom and daughter, you know, thinking, well, this might be hereditary, we can't get the vaccine. You know, we, we just can't do it. Seeing this upfront and personal, they're still not anti-vax. They're just, again, cautious, and they want to talk to their doctor more. They want to try to figure out, 
you know, if it's genetic, if there's something in them that the vaccine is, is going to cause them to react to the vaccine. And so just keeping that in mind when we talk about this discussion. And you brought up the issue of, well, you brought up the uh, Representative Howard, the issue of doctors being allowed to practice medicine and making those judgments on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, Senator Cole Course mentioned this issue with the Texas Medical Board. In Houston, where I live, uh, one of the doctors there who was very vocal about alternative treatments that were not necessarily approved by the uh, majority of the medical field um, advocated for some medications that were FDA approved, but she was using them off-label. Uh, Dr. Mary Bowden is now facing uh, action from the Texas Medical Board. And in learning about that story, we found that uh, you can make anonymous complaints to that board, and uh, she does not have the right to face her accuser, something that uh, we would expect when uh, you know, we're accused of a, of a crime or facing losing our license. Uh, Senator Hall has proposed some reforms to the Texas Medical Board. I'd like to get your, your buy-in or your, your uh, excuse me, your input on uh, what you think should happen there. We'll start with you, Representative Howard, with your, your medical background. Yeah, I have lots there that you're asking about. And now where I'm uh, going to go with that right now is that um, absolutely we want doctors to be able to practice medicine and to treat their individual patients based on their me best medical judgment. And doctors do not always agree on everything. I think in the cases we're talking about, though, there was... Uh, a, a critical mass of agreement in the medical community about what the appropriate treatments were. And because this has been so polarizing and there has been so much information out there that um, is not always based on sound science, that there was probably more of an asserted effort to step in that they might not have done otherwise, looking at the the the, the public health outcomes, which are very different than us making individual decisions about things that only affect us. The decisions that we make about vaccinations when we're talking about infectious diseases affect many others. And in this case, we're talking about those who are immunocompromised and, and can't get the vaccine even if, even if they want it. Uh, young babies who can't get the vaccine yet. Um, those that are perhaps have autoimmune diseases, those that are uh, cancer patients, all kinds of people who their right to be in society is limited if they can't safely go out without fear of being exposed to something. Those are the kinds of decisions that public health has always been faced with having to make, always looking at having to balance that individual choice with what's gonna happen with the, the, the larger community. So in terms of, of, of that, that's the way I would approach that. The, in terms of the medical board, I know we've, we've dealt with this before, Senator, in terms of looking at uh, what the medical board's powers are to do uh, over physicians. So uh, I haven't been involved in that discussion. I think maybe you have been, so I'm gonna to defer to her on that one. Yeah, and, and I do think that it's time to look at some of this again. When when I was dealing during COVID with some of these complaints, uh, you realize not only can it be anonymous, you don't even have to be the patient of the person making the complaint. So when I ask how many of these complaints are coming from out of state and are not the patients, I didn't, I wasn't able to get the data, but um, it was confirmed that there were many of those. So... Um, it is it is time to look at that. Um, you know, I I have to say that um, there is a lot of information out there, and some of it can be misinformation. But the thing that that that, that I say about COVID nineteen in 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 this regard, and that vaccine, we don't require influenza vaccines. And let me tell you, influenza kills people. It absolutely kills people. The only two times I've ever been in the emergency room in my life is um, when I had influenza. I mean, Donna Howard, she kind of saved my, not, my life. One morning I was like, I called her and said, I'm so sick, I can't even drive myself to the um, emergency room. Jimmy's, you know, 85 miles away in Brenham. I don't know what to do. She's like, 
I'm on my way. I'm on my way. And I mean, you know, I end up, you know, in an ER. And, Do I you know, talk like that? So, so, so having said that, and, you know, we make light of these situations. I had H1N1, actually, you know, and uh, I never forget I was so sick. Jimmy stayed home from work that day. That means I was really sick. But... I, I I really I really have to say something. You know I, I'm 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 you know I I'm very sensitive to people, but I, I don't know that COVID nineteen vaccines work. I mean I, I I'm not convinced that they do, um, but I'm not convinced. I, again I'm like um, Representative Harris in that I'm not anti-vax. Has po the, has the polio vaccine done wonders? Of course it has. Meeps and um, uh, mumps and measles. But there was lots of research that went on forever and ever and ever, and it wasn't mRNA based. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, at least at one point during uh, the pandemic, you had Johnson and Johnson as a non mRNA option that was just taken away from us. Novavax never came to the market. I can't figure this out. I mean, I just cannot figure this out. And Novavax was derived from, you know, you can't make this up, a bark of a tree. Uh, and but it never came. I kept asking and asking, "Where's Novavax? Let's get Novavax approved." That would give some people some options, uh, but we didn't. And so, I, I, I'm going to tell you: Look, let the data drive our decisions. Let the data drive our decisions. So, does COVID-19 vaccine really work? And so, you know, there's some that have. A hypothesis. I think that's wonderful for science. Have a hypothesis that the more you're vaccinated, it weakens your immune system. So let's have VAERS. Let's actually dig into this and find out so that we know moving forward. Why do we fear that? I do not know why we fear it. And I say that to everyone. I, I would say that to, you know, I, we had an 11 hour hearing and Dr. Robert Malone was there, who was one of the guys that was involved in the you know, the, the incubator of mRNA. I want to listen to all sides of this, but prove it with facts, okay? If people are not getting myocarditis from mRNA vaccines, then prove it. Say that that 12 year old child or that 15 year old child or that soccer player that died in Europe was not vaccinated. Please help us because what we are doing, and y'all can tell I'm really emotional, we are tearing down the public health system. This is no good for the future. The lack of trust, it kills me, the lack of trust. And so I'm trying to reinstitute trust in public health. Um, and I think that it's very needed. Public health is, you know, something that we need as a society. And it's, it's, it was meant to protect you and your loved ones, but we're, we've kind of skewed, like it was this way or the highway. You know, does budesonide work for, um, you know, early treatment of COVID? Does, you know, you, you know uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine or does ivermectin? My gosh, you know, what were the side effects even if you tried it? I mean, like, how many people you know who, has can who have cancer try some experimental drug? Because you're trying to stay alive. You're willing to risk that. So... You know, I, I'm just so frustrated. So I'm going to just introduce common sense legislation that says, look, let's go back to the data. Let's get past the darkness of those two and a half years where, you know, you were canceled on social media or you were, uh, you know, your, your license was taken away. And let's let the data drive our future decisions. And if we do that, I believe that we can restore faith in our public health system. So, you know, I have many, I have many emotions about this, but again, um, there is a large distrust that has been brought about, and we have to let the data drive our future decisions. So don't be fearful of, of what it reveals to us. Then we'll know. I mean, and we've known this. We've done this. It's taken us a long time in some of these situations to go back and to look at experimental drugs that did bad things to people. And we have, you know, um, folks, some people are hesitant on vaccines because um, of the past. And so we, we, we have to move forward in a way that I believe is, is good and scientific and just don't squelch and silence voices that are questioning. That's how science evolves, is questions, absolute questions. 
And that's what I'm looking to do. Can I mean, I, even I the CDC is now admitted that natural time, immunity so is better than uh, the vaccine. So. Oh, I totally agree with you, Senator, in terms of let's look at the facts and the data. And I guess where I would want to have the, some discussion with you is, is it... Are we going to be able to rely on the medical and scientific community, or is that not a place where we can trust at this point in time? Because you know the, the, the American Medical Association, the American Pediatric Society, uh, the university institutions, uh, they're the ones doing the science and the research and, and have the knowledge in the background to look at the data to help us craft what's the best policy to move forward. Is that going to be something... That they should be definitely be in the discussion. Uh, I think Europe is ahead of us on this in some regards um, because of some of the reactions that they were seeing. So, but I don't, I think a really wise man once said this to me, the human desire to be correct transcends all other human desires. Okay, so stay with me. Why do I make that statement? I mean, think about the kamikaze pilots uh, during World War II, they were willing to, you know, in the very end, they would crash um, their planes into uh, the ships to do as much damage as they get. They were willing because the human desire to be correct transcends all other human desires. What I fear, because there was such strident, there was, they, they were, some people were so strident on believing that they were right that they can't admit that they're wrong. But over time, science. <laughs> Science, you know, that, that is how we've been able to move forward. My gosh, look at mental health. You know, they used to take people and they would shock them. They would give them electric waves and do these horrible things to them. And over time, they were able to be proven wrong, and then we were able to get past that and move forward. That, Representative Howard, is what I'm looking for forward to. So with our AMA and our, uh, you know, American Pediatric Society, I, I don't want them to bunker in. I want you to move to a new stage and let's open this up. A VAER system where you actually get those reactions, have it reportable would be great. Um, you know, and, and then I think our treatment for COVID has evolved. I'm hoping, you know, as the strain has gone along, um, it, it finally has started reacting the way that it should, and, and it's it's lesser. You know, I always go back to Delta when we were here in August of 2021. Delta was a beast, right? I mean, it was there were a lot of sick people, but Omicron was like having the sniffles. Not to everyone, not to everyone, but it it you know we're moving along through this through this, but it's going to be with us forever, just like the influenza. Go get yourself some type A influenza and see how you feel tomorrow morning. You may, too, end up in the emergency room. I'm sure I am not alone in wishing we could continue this conversation for another couple of hours. This is very interesting. It will happen in the legislature. There will be many hours that all of you could join us in debating these. Great conversation. Thank you all for being here and for handling these sensitive topics in uh, such a, a civil and wonderful way. We really appreciate your time. I appreciate all of you. Holly, being can here. I say, do you know how hard it is for, you know, Representative Howard has served for so long and, and to come with, you know, two Republicans? I just so admire her. And, and I mean, like, we, we sat near each other on the House floor, and this is what makes Texas different, okay? Because there's going to be bills of mine that uh, Representative Howard votes for, and there's going to be bills of mine that I'm sure she's going to vote against, and that's going to be true of me. But in the Texas House and Texas Senate, we sit together, we work together, we try to work things out, we listen to one another, and I think that the rest of the nation, and certainly the United States Congress, could benefit from the example of this. And one more shout out to Connie Burton. You know, I, I like to take credit for the Texan because after she lost her election, she said, what should I do? And I said, man, you should go into journalism. <laughs> and we talked for a long time about that. And so I, I feel kind of like a parent here, you know. Thank, so. you Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you all so much for listening. If you've been enjoying our podcast, it would be awesome if you would review us on iTunes. And if there's a guest you'd love to hear on our show, give us a shout on Twitter tweet at the Texan News. We're so proud to have you standing with us as we seek to provide real journalism in an age of disinformation. 
We're paid for exclusively by readers like you, so it's important we all do our part to support The Texan by subscribing and telling your friends about us. God bless you, and God bless Texas.